Welcome back. Welcome in. This is Country Roads Confidential at Earsports.com, part of the Paramount Podcast Network. I am Mike Casaza. Once again, responding to the signal for an emergency podcast here. And this is kind of similar to previous ones, but also different in the nature of that it arrived. West Virginia has added another to the basketball roster. Chris Anderson's phone blowing up about the news as we speak because Trey Mitchell, formerly of UMass and Texas, now part of the Mountain program. We've done this before for Eric Stevenson, Joe Toussaint, and even Evan Matthews. We do it for Trey Mitchell, but with a twist, Chris, because I have to take off a shoe here. 5, 10, 11, 12, 10. 14 players on scholarship. Tattoo on the inside of my left bicep says you could only have 13 in a college basketball team. I guess we'll get to Mr. Mitchell in a second, but what does this mean about college basketball in 2022-23 when you can briefly go over 13 and have to get back under? Well, I just assumed this was uh, a perk of being on the rules committee for Huggins, right? And this, yeah. Isn't this what's going on here? Just uh, making it work. Don't worry about it. Get to 15 and figure it out later. Uh, I think maybe he's still transitioning from the COVID rules down to 13. I think that's what everybody gets a transition year, mm-hmm. or at least that's what you can pitch. But this is the reality of recruiting. I mean, this has been going on for decades in all sports you know hey you end up kind of you every everything is fluid nothing is definitive like even signatures obviously um so there is going to be a move to be made and again i think it's interesting here is that the bigger story than the actual addition of said player 12 months ago it's a huge rock in the lake, right? Big splash, lots of ripples, because he was one of the top transfers in the portal. And part of that, highly celebrated. And oddly enough, Chris, highly criticized recruiting class mm-hmm. uh, at Texas. Lots of arrows from one corner of the Big 12, as we remember. But, I mean, a big-time player who is adding to his game as a big, who can do some things in the perimeter. And it's really big news just from a talent acquisition. Here's a four-star top 100 player a couple years ago from Pittsburgh, who also prepped in New England where West Virginia has some roots. So there's a connection here for sure. Never really danced with each other last year, and here they are doing this. And and again, this this might not even be the end of things, which we can get to, but it's big, big news. Let's put things into canisters here. We'll talk about future roster implications for this move, maybe for a subsequent one in a second. Let's just talk about Mitchell here. Um, six, nine, four star top 100 best player in Pittsburgh, but excuse me in Pennsylvania, but also Connecticut while he was in high school. Um, again, played in Pittsburgh prep for a year in, in Connecticut. So good big time stats, big time score at UMass. Um, I can go over some of the biographical stuff in a minute. And then last year, uh, just a, who knows kind of a year, but he's going to have three years to play two seasons that might be worth remembering because of eligibility and things and as we speak we don't quite yet know for sure whether or not he'll be eligible right away if there's a waiver if he's a graduate if he's already uses one-time transfer but let's just say he's on the court in the upcoming season that's obviously the intent Uh, who and what do they have here i think they have a a stretch four stretch five kind of guy that is very capable of shooting the three Uh, i believe his, his shooting percentage from three when he was at UMass was around 36% combined between the two years, 35, 36%, which when you have a guy shooting three, uh, three threes a game, that's pretty good. You'll take that. Um, He can rebound. It's not like he's exclusively a perimeter type of guy. Uh, Defensively, I think he can defend the post. He is a bigger body that can, that can kind of bulk up against some of those guys that are going to be on the block. Offensively, It is almost entirely like an outside in type of game. I mean, he shoots threes, as I just mentioned, but when he's not shooting threes, he's not posting up. He's still picking and popping. He's still coming out to the top of the key. And you watch the film from his time at UMass and it's it's uh, it's either shooting a three or shot faking a three and driving to the basket, which 
is a great mismatch against some bigger guys. I think he was able to exploit that playing in the uh, Atlantic 10 conference for UMass going against guys, teams that probably are not going to have a lot of 6'9", 6'10", bigs that are also capable of playing on the perimeter. And I think that's part of the reason for what you saw at Texas. Just, a, a, you know, a slight, and we can talk more about it in a second, decline in his offensive game in Austin. And, and you know, he obviously had to face, you know, other guys like him, guys that are 6'9", 6'10", and, and can move and move their feet and stay in front of the guys on the perimeter. And that shot fake and drive to the basket is not going to work as often as it did at UMass. but. This is somebody that could fit in with West Virginia's offense with what they're trying to do offensively while not being a liability defensively. 6'9", 220 um, has really gotten his body into shape from where he was in that high school prep range. And and you're right, moves. He's an outside end guy who can play inside. Uh, five 30-point games in his really kind of one and a half seasons at UMass. They only played, I think, 15 games, and he was in 13 of them. Mm-hmm. in the COVID season, the, um, the, the season back. And then just, again, just a chemistry experiment that not everybody and everything could work out as imagined last season at Texas. He also left the team um, for personal reasons. And Chris Beard was pretty clear that it, it wasn't school or local rules. It wasn't law enforcement. It wasn't anything with COVID. Um, so who knows? But the point you make about outside in is just, I can't get past it. Uh, this is the team that wants to be bigger near the basket, and it adds a very good uh, four slash five, who's kind of an outside end guy. Can he be? Can he be Chris? Somebody who can play inside, who can get on the block, who can put back baskets that he grabs off the rim, or is it going to be more of the four out, five out with him? And then is this even a bad question to ask? Because this does look like a roster that's going to have all sorts of abilities to ship to shift shapes and and either match up or create advantages. Yeah, this is not your Derek Culver. This is not your four out one in guy. Uh, I mean, I guess it's possible. He has the size, he has the length, but that's just not what you see on film. That's not what you saw in high school. It's not what you saw at UMass. It's not really what you saw at Texas either. Um, He is an outside in big uh, he he is more comfortable on the perimeter. I, I'm talking offensively again. He's more comfortable on the perimeter. He's more comfortable driving. He's more comfortable facing up. He is not going to be your guy that's sitting on the low post, fighting with another big man, throwing his arm up in the air, calling for the ball so he can make a back to the basket move. That's you know that's what Derek Culver was. That was a guy that could, you could just plant on the block and go four out one in and and spread your shooters and hope that Culver could go one on one on the post. Mitchell's not that guy if that's what Huggins is looking for. But, I mean, Huggins knows that. You know, he's seen him, he's played against him, saw him in high school, saw him in college. So that, I just don't think that's what they're recruiting him for. But the big – so which brings me to the big question for me, is he the second big on the court at the same time? Are we doing the second too big look in Morgantown again? Oh, boy. <laughs> I mean, him, that's him and him and Muhammad. I, I watched a video of Muhammad and the pronouncing pronunciation of his last name was Wage. I watched another oh. video and it was Wagyu. Yeah. So call him Big Mo. Yeah. All right. So him and Big Mo were interesting. Um, him and Jimmy Bell. That's interesting. Him and Okonkwo. That's interesting. But he's the one that's in all these. I wonder if he's not a four um, at times, too. That could be really. And then if he's the five, who's the four? This one seemed apparent to me because they just didn't have an offensively inclined big. And then if they but right now, the way you look at things, Pat Suna could be playing a lot of minutes and it just did not track. They were going to give a junior college player without really any of this experience at this level, an opportunity to have a lot of experience at this level. And then, I mean, kind of a similar thing with what they did at the wing. They could have put like Jamel King out there. They went and they got Emmett Matthews. They could have used Seth Wilson or they could have used Kobe Johnson in the backcourt. They went out and they got Joe Toussaint and Narek Stevens. And this just seems like that they're padding um, the present and the future here. They're they're getting as many guys in that have experience and can play this year. And, and I just didn't think that there was a chance they were going to leave this one undone. I know we were talking about before, hey, they're at 13 of them at Matthews. They're done. And we kept saying no. And people kept saying how. And we just, there's ways to do it. Let's get into this too. Um, you're right. This has been happening forever. I, I think it's comical that people think all the roster turnover from the past couple of years that 
Huggins has endured, and this is not just past couple years, it's a long time, is simply players leaving and not being happy. It's not. I mean, there there are conversations that are very frank. Dear player, you're not going to be the guy or get the playing time that you think. You might want to try somewhere else. These things happen. The trick here is that, barring something highly comical to me, which is a team that posted a social media graphic with its five returning players about loyalty, suddenly getting rid of one of those players, you're going to have guys who've been signed since November or guys who have transferred in the past couple of months. One of these guys is not going to be here to make room for Mitchell. Um, We've really kind of tiptoed around this from different things we've heard, but we've heard two names, two situations above all others, which again, I'm following breadcrumbs here and just taking this where it's taken me from start to finish. I don't necessarily think that they're done, but one player is probably leaving. I can't see it being a, a returning player, which is five. I can't see it being one of the five transfers. That means that one of the three players who signed in November, uh, Josiah Davis, Josiah Harris, or Pat Sumnick, probably not going to make it to campus. Well, one, we've seen how this could work out. I mean, in the past, going all the way back, and, and some of these were for different reasons, but like I, I think Elijah Macon was in like four straight signing classes, I feel like. Mm -hmm. because he was high school and then prep school and then prep school, you know, and and kept getting delayed. And and this is something that just with academics for basketball are different than football in that. I think it's easier to go. I mean, with prep school, you're close academically and you think you can get to where you need to be eligible in a semester, maybe two. And in basketball, that's usually, I mean, that's the case, too. That's not any different than, than the junior college option, except when it comes to actual playing and improving and going against top talent, prep school for football is just not even close to the same level as junior college. You're better off going to junior college, playing against top talent, bettering yourself, and getting ready for the next level. While in basketball, staying there, doing a fifth year, and going to prep school – is much better. You are going to play against the best of the best of the best when you do that. So we've seen that. And there are two high school guys that are currently signed. Um, You know, Josiah Davis came from Canada. Don't know about his, you know, age classification, that kind of stuff can, can make it tricky. Maybe it's best if he does another year in prep school, who knows? Uh, Josiah Harris just went down the state tournament with an injury. Um, how serious is it? He hasn't said potential for surgery. Not sure. Uh, what if he's hurt and can't play this year? Is it best for him to come and just sit the bench or is it best to come and get rehab or get rehabbed and go somewhere for prep school? Don't know that answer yet either, at least as of this moment that we're recording it. And then Sumnek, who you mentioned as a, the third potential third option. Don't know what's going to happen there, but I mean, we've seen already West Virginia take a commitment from a guy and then look at him and say, Hey, you know, eh, maybe you might want to look around might be best for both parties. Things are getting a little tight here. If you want more playing time, I mean, we'll honor it. You signed it. We have to, but might find some more telling time somewhere else. Um, and they did that with Fede Federico who uh, right, ended up at Pitt, right? Yeah. I think. Um, Again, so the, those are the three guys. I'm with you that it, it's not going to be Wagyu. It's not going to be Bell. Like, they wouldn't have taken those commitments this late in the game if they weren't going to. Like, that, that's a little – would be off if they took a commitment and a signature at this point. The other three guys were all the early guys. So I'm just running through the scenario for each one where one of them might not be the thing. It's, and it's not some nefarious, like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is so slimy. It, it's just not – that's not what it is. Everybody works together. Everybody wants to, you know, to, to find their happy place, if you will. And and they probably already talked about this with one or more of them already. And by the way, who's silent, not saying anything? Mm-hmm. Those guys. Yep. They're very hard to reach, very hard to read the tea leaves there, too. Um, yeah, listen, you can come to Morgantown and, and red shirt. I don't know. That hasn't really worked out very well. I know it's like an admirable thing, but. Show me great evidence of that happening. And number one, number two, players don't want to redshirt. And if you come here and you redshirt and you transfer, you lose that ability to transfer once. 
for what a year you played seven games in, in 40 minutes or you didn't play at all and you just lifted weights and practiced no if you can prep for a part of a year or all of a year that might be good and it's something that's that you're seeing now too and it's because of the glut on the rosters a lot of players are having to do this more than they want to and, and it's not a terrible thing too there is a way to make it work academically athletically um and then i mean if harris comes in and he's not 100 percent and he misses, I don't know, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks of the of the offseason preseason. This is not a situation to be coming from behind because the roster is what it is right now, especially in the front court with the way they're adding to it. If it's, it's you know, if it's Harris who's who's here and he's behind, you know, a Mitchell and a Matthews and whomever else might be in front of him right now, is he going to get caught up in what's his first year going to be like? Those are just dynamics. Um, I'll say this. We will have more information on this on the board. It's going to be on the VIP Country Roads Confidential. You can check it out. But we've been talking about this for quite some time to the point that this isn't a great surprise, which leads to our next transition, Chris. We're talking about one spot here, and I just don't think they're done. All the intel that you and I have had from the very beginning was that this was going to be in excess of one or two scholarship players. I'm not going to name the name here. There is a connection on the team and now new to the team to another guard who's in the transfer portal who – could be had is very interesting it's a name people know but the point is that i just i just not sure they're done um if they can make if they can make room they're going to make room right now because they've gone this far i just don't think that they're looking at their roster and saying we're good they're looking at the roster saying where can we improve where can we get a four seed in the ncaa tournament a two seed in the big 12 tournament i mean are those realistic no are those goals absolutely and I don't know why you would stop short right now, especially when there's so much talent in there and there are avenues to invite them in if you can create the space. Um, I'm not saying that there's more. I'm saying there's a conversation, certainly. It's up with a player, and you know, will that player stay in the draft? Will that player stay in school? Will that player go to another school? Who knows? But the fact that there is a, a robust conversation about one player in particular, as well as other possibilities, I just refuse to believe that this is the end of it right now. I'm with you, and I I, I wonder what the uh, Venn diagram is of people that are calling for Huggins to fix it and anybody that's upset about what's happening right now. Because if you want him to fix it, he's trying. He's doing everything he can, and then some, it seems like, to, to fix it, to get the guys in that can make this a quick turnaround. Um, and in the world of basketball recruiting right now college basketball recruiting and i guess college athletics in general with the transfer portal wide open and and it's always changing yeah i don't want to say there's no sense in you know banking on four-year guys getting high school kids that you hope to develop for four years but it's right there that transfer portal right there that transfer market's right there it makes it a lot easier to make a quick turnaround in sports and west virginia's trying to do that and so I, I don't I don't know if these are the answers, but we're going to find out. And Bob Huggins is trying. Once again, quick turnaround from you and me, Chris, the emergency podcast. Once again, in the books, Trey Mitchell on board, other dominoes uh, falling, leaning, let's say. Stay tuned. We'll have it covered. Until it actually is finished. Until then, I'm Mike Casaza, And I'm Chris Anderson. I'll talk to you next time.